IQ Smart Parent is made possible in part by the McCune Foundation and the Grable Foundation. On this episode of IQ Smart Parent, discover how technology is transforming art and culture. Since the earliest cave paintings, artists have evolved with new tools available to them. Today, we'll meet people who are inspired by the exciting digital techniques available for 21st century artists. From multimedia installations to a digital device jam session, learn how to inspire the budding digital artists in your family. We're all about digital artists on today's IQ Smart Parent, and it starts right now. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Daria Chisholm. We love to talk about science, technology, engineering, and math here on IQ Smart Parent. But today we're shifting gears to talk about digital art. How do 21st century tools fuel the imagination and expand the ways we express ourselves? And we're going to kick it off by making music. I'm very happy to introduce our first guest, Gilles Teixeira. Thanks so much for being here. Welcome. So you describe yourself as a musician and a sound artist. Mm -hmm. How do those two things combine and what do you do? <laughs> My view on it is more, the difference lies more with the intention of the artist than with the actual product because there are pieces of sound art that could be considered music and there are pieces of music that could be considered sound art. I think I just got into it because I started as a classical trained musician and at some point, I, I don't know, I think I just wanted more and I started getting curious about that field of sound art that was wider and had more possibilities into it. Now, you call something called Textra Workshop, and yeah. that includes a combination of a few different things, technology and orchestra, in mm -hmm. fact, comes the name. Yep. So talk a little bit about what that is. Well, the Textra was this kind of educational workshop format that, uh, as a teaching artist, um, I devise workshops, creative workshops, that then I deploy in all sorts of settings. Uh, and the Techestra is one of those formats that really kind of derives directly from uh, my work as an artist, because I'm basically combining digital technology with people and music. Well, you know, let's discover what you okay. have here, because you've brought some pretty interesting I brought some things, toys, so let's yes. talk about those. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this first one that I'm going to show you, this one I created for a workshop with toddlers. So there was a moment when we had to sing a lullaby. So if you rock the teddy bear and then sing, and then you have this beautiful melody, and then if the teddy bear wakes up, all of a so sudden, So you have to explain, how is this making the noise? It, yeah, so we've got a teddy inside, bear. Inside, yeah, inside the teddy bear, there's a, a remote control from a, a, I don't know, like some sort of a computer game. And, uh, and it detects motion. So what I'm doing is I'm actually sending the information from the motion to my computer via Bluetooth and then mapping it to a musical instrument. But and it you can do more. The... Are you gonna try? Yeah, Go. sure. <laughs> cool, I love it. <laughs> you also brought a few other things, so we wanna take a peek at what you have sure. as well. I don't know if you ever played ukulele before, did I, I didn't, and I certainly I'm haven't sure done yet. one with it. <laughs> this one you probably never used. I, I like this one. I like the message that it passes about a poor, broken ukulele that apparently would be like, okay, let's just throw it away, right? The, the consumerist approach. Mm -hmm. It's broken, doesn't do its original function, let's throw it away. But from a creative point of view, there's so much more you can do. So using a microphone that captures percussion and using also my computer and um, a digital musical instrument, I kind of gave new life to the ukulele, and now it's playable again. You try it. Yeah, this <laughs> is really, really fast. So you wrote the code on it, and yep. it's just, you've got it obviously tied to the computer here, but was this very difficult to come up with? Well, not at, you know, you just need the skill set, the coding skill set, and uh, in the beginning it was, it, as, as anybody that has gone into coding know how frustrating it can be, but once you start understanding how coding works, okay. and then it's about having, you know, having an idea and, and seeing, things, seeing the things with the potential they have, the hidden potential, and not just by their normal usage. Now, you also have figured out a way to, to make sound through body movement. So yes. if you'll display that for us. Sure, sure. There's a little bit of dancing involved. <laughs> uh, I'm using a, a device. It's also a gaming device 
that captures, um, it's through infrared technology, captures the movement of my body. So for example, if I lower and raise my hand, this happens. If I move back and forth, I can change the pitch. And if I go lower, I can have softer volume. You had to have a lot of fun creating this, I'm sure. <laughs> this was actually created by a couple of kids in one of my workshops. So the coding, I, I kind of gave them the tools, gave them the instructions, and then they created the tool. Jill, that was absolutely fascinating. I can't Thank wait you. to learn more, and I'm sure we'll get some more details since you're going to stick around and lead us in a musical performance like nothing I've ever seen before. But up first, take a look at a unique partnership among after-school arts organizations as they train the next generation of audio engineers. Drifting down a road to a place that I don't know. But Tough Sound Apprenticeship Program is run by myself, Amos Levy, and Kitoko Chagua. We are partnering with six after-school arts organizations, and each of them has provided one student for us to teach them um, audio engineering and production. Drop, drop one of your clips into record. The apprentices are learning from two people that are so deeply immersed in sound production. Don't forget, you're only going to record on the clip that is in record. What we're pushing is the idea that as self-producing media makers, they can build the skills to do pretty much what I do. They could record voiceovers for video, they could do sound design for theater, they could do location sound. The idea is to give them the tools that they can use to find different ways to work in the sound field. Should we just run through the whole track then? I'm just drifting away, away. So we're back and you can see we've got a studio filled with a lot of folks here uh, as, long, as well as Gilles. So Gilles, you brought CME along yes. and we want to know about it, how it works and okay. how, what inspired you to create it. Well, CME started, the whole process started like four years ago now. It's like it's a, basically this project has kind of swallowed the last four years of my artistic life and also educational. Um, CIMI stands for Collaborative Experiential Electronic Musical Instrument. And I always felt like, you know, there was something, there was like this kind of wall that a person that never actually had a chance to learn a musical instrument, there was kind of a wall that they would hit that they couldn't really go past that because like, okay, I can do percussion or I can, I can sing, but I cannot play the guitar or I cannot play the violin. And people would always step back like, oh, I don't know nothing about music. Right, right. So that was the first thing I really wanted to widen the circle of people that can actually have a collaborative musical experience. Well, we've got a wide circle yeah. of people who are ready for a collaborative experience. Who, who, <laughs> can I just ask you a question, actually? Who already plays a musical instrument? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other reason, which I think is the real mission that I found out, not from the beginning, but as the project went along, which is, it's just, the last few years since I started developing CME, we're more and more getting almost addicted to our digital devices and we're always looking at those screens and it's kind of promoting this isolation, this disconnection. Mm -hmm. And uh, through the power of music and using actually the same tool that's promoting that isolation, I try to bring people together. I well, try to make people look at each other. Yeah, well, let's play along with this. this Great. Is, okay, let's like do a little CME jam. All right. <laughs> Ready, guys? Okay, I'm going to start the <laughs> drums, and I'm going to start the bass, and then just follow my lead, okay? Are you guys ready? Here we go. And... Acoustic guitar, go. Jazz guitar, solo. Muted trumpet, go! Rhodes electric piano, go! Trombone! Vibraphone! Get ready, let's go back to the ensemble with some short nose. And we're gonna end.
hand on the long nose. That's it. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's really a lot of fun, right? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so you have to tell me, how do you think this up? I mean, really, this is this is genius. I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I don't know if it is genius, but I just felt that it made sense uh, in the terms of like the, the the times we live in. I think it's important to incorporate technology, but I think we are in, in now. We need a balance because I think we are in the digital revolution, and all of a sudden everything is digital. But we still have bodies, and bodies still move in space, and. This is about combining both and trying to find a balance. So through music combined with the digital technology, we kind of go a little back to our, you know, to making good eye contact, to be focused on one-on-one -on -one conversation, all these good old basic social skills that I feel like we're kind of losing. Yeah, well, we had a lot of fun playing with this, right, thank guys? Thank you. You guys were great. Yeah, thank you so much for being here, <laughs> thank Gilles. Thank you. You're really delightful. And we've got more great advice from digital artists and educators coming up. But first, check out these fourth graders and their unique work creating textiles. You're going to start your positive threads. Right now, my fourth graders are working on an e-textiles project where they had to plug in a circuit board to a computer, program it, and now they're sewing in conductive thread to get their lights and buzzer to connect on a circuit. And loop it three times. E-textiles is a project designed to teach computational thinking, circuitry, a little bit of programming for students, and gives them the opportunity to design shirts that light up and are programmed in the way that they want them to be. T-shirts are great because they allow students to use their creativity and practice circuitry, which they're already learning, and then have a wearable object at the end of the unit. STEAM is integrating science, technology, engineering, arts, and math together and coming up with projects that give students the opportunity to try out these different disciplines in creative ways. It just sparks a lot of interest. They love it. We're talking about the intersection of art, technology, science, and culture, and I'm so happy to welcome our next guest to continue the conversation. Golan Levin is an artist, and he's also the director of the Frank Ratchie Studio for Creative Inquiry at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And I'm happy to also introduce Kevin Clancy, another interdisciplinary artist whose work has been exhibited across the United States in Vancouver and in South Africa. Welcome gentlemen to the show. Thank, Thank you. you. So I would think that most of us when we think about artists think that they work in mediums with clay, pencil, canvas, but how is technology really changing the way that artists are working these days? Um, it's certainly true that plenty of artists uh, do work with paint and, and clay and so on, uh, but really artists are able to uh, and, and should be um, willing to consider using the medium of our times as well, you know, of any time in history, whether it's you know ancient media like clay or whether it's contemporary media like computers. Um, so, uh, you know, in the work that I do and my students, you know, we're thinking about how to use the materials of, of contemporary culture, whether it's software or computer hardware or electronics, to create new culture, to figure out the expressive possibilities and opportunities that can be uh, obtained with these media, and also um, uh, to figure out, you know, how and what does it say about who we are and where we're heading. So let's see if we can get a sense for what the work looks like. Kevin, you recently had uh, an exhibit at Mattress Factory, mm -hmm. your Iris Siri. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so I was artist in residence at Mattress Factory, which is an installation art museum here in Pittsburgh. Uh, you create a site-specific work for a room in the museum, so you use the room as um, a studio, create the work um, specifically for that space, um, so Iris Siri was um, an homage to both Iris, the goddess of the rainbow, and Siri, the goddess of the smartphone. Um, well, that, now that's <laughs> creative. I love that. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely like an element of dark humor uh -huh. in that work. Um, so uh, with Iris, I started with all of the windows, covering them in this dichroic window film. The daylight filters through and creates a rainbow spectrum in the room, and then you're also looking out at the world in this rainbow gradient um, fashion that I think will like psychologically change how you look at the outside world. Um, so that was the iris part. And then the Siri part, I had um, four laptops with cats on them that were like these guardian figures of the internet and um, browser window animations that kept popping up in this hypnotic way, uh, referring to the way that we're just kind of hypnotized 
um, by the spectacle of the internet. And Golan, if you would just share with us, I mean, I saw your website, I saw some really interesting things. So talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that. Um, so uh, I'm particularly interested in thinking about how the media that now exists on, you know, on computers and, and other kinds of technological media um, can be used to make new kinds of expressive kinds of kinds of experiences. And I, I feel like artists sort of owe it to themselves to, to explore these things. Um, one thing that computers can do really well uh, is to create behavior. Um, and so the, the kinds of experiences that I'm creating with software and, and hardware are um, looking at things like media like, you know, like lasers or robotics uh, or software technologies like machine learning and artificial intelligence to see how they can make experiences that are maybe outside the vo sort of the, the typical vocabulary of sort of corporate media, day-to-day -day office tasks. And we're looking at things like, you know, how can we make experiences that are poetic, lyrical or poignant, uh, whimsical, you know, provocative or sublime. So our, my project, The Ghost Pole Propagator, uh, is a sort of a full body experience. And I think we can, we can talk about that both in terms of the experience of the developer and also the experience of the user. Um, from the experience of the developer, you know, I want to get away from the sort of mouse and keyboard um, that, uh, you know, it characterizes so much sort of office interactions with computers. Uh, and to do that, from, to the experience of the user, we're sort of saying, well, look, we can, we can understand what your body is doing. Um, let's reflect it back to you in a way that may, maybe allows you to understand your own unique character, your own unique way of moving through the world. How would you say that we could really encourage parents to help their children using technology and art in, in the ways that you have? Um, I have kids, and um, there's a lot of different ways. I, I think, uh, first of all, increasingly there are tools, programming toolkits that are specifically designed uh, for children. Uh, an example is the Scratch program programming language out of MIT, uh, which is really easy for kids as young as seven or eight to learn, uh, and it allows them to, uh, uh, to make animations. I think one other really important point uh, is to kind of meet uh, children where they are and allow them to learn how to use these technologies in ways that are relevant to them. Uh, for example, I was surprised to learn that Minecraft, which is very popular with, uh, with you know, kids six and, and up, more or less, um, has a programming language that you can use in it. Uh, and so it makes a lot of sense to sort of say, well, you can begin to start to make interactive objects within Minecraft using these kinds of programming uh, technologies and languages or other kinds of computational thinking skills. And the kids are intrinsically motivated to do so because it's in an environment that they care about. So I think it's really important to meet kids where they are. Kevin, what, as it relates to bringing parents and kids into the fold around technology and art? I think everything Golan said was right on, and um, to lead by example, and to be there every step of the way, and work with them and collaborate with them, um, and to teach them kind of basic principles that um, technology and computing can be a creative act and not just a consumer act, to not just use the software and the devices as they're sold to you to consume things, but to use them creatively and break them and hack them and play yeah, with them. And that was what I was going to say. How can you encourage kids to use certain tools in certain ways, particularly if they're interested enough that this one day may be a profession for them? I think foregrounding it and play and exploration um, from a very early age. And what Golan said was that like really, really young kids can learn programming and um, the technology, we've seen how exponential it is and that like their world is going to be completely different from our world. So we can't entirely teach them like what the technology is itself. We have to teach them to adapt and grow with the technology because it's going to be in a place that we can't even imagine in their lifetimes. I know, I, and, and that is going to be very interesting for us to see in, in years to come. So gentlemen, thank you so much for being on the show today. We do appreciate it. Coming up, more advice for nurturing the digital artist in your family. But first, Check this out. Learn more about digital art and find free resources online by entering these key phrases in your favorite search engine. Creative coding, new media art, best creative apps, best software for digital art, create digital music, and technology modern art. We're wrapping up our exploration of digital art with advice from students from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Please welcome Joyce Wong and Sarah Atkins. So you are both students in the BXA Intercollege Degree Program at CMU. So tell me a little bit more about that program and what you're studying there. Um, so BXA is this 
weird little program where you can combine art with some other discipline at CMU. Um, so I do computer science and drama, and within drama, I'm a video and media designer. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, Sarah? Um, and my concentrations are in the School of Music and the School of Computer Science. And within the School of Music, I do music technology. So when you were growing up, was technology a big part of your life as a child? Yeah, um, definitely when I was young, I felt like I was exploring a lot of technology, uh, definitely on the creative side. Um, when I was in elementary school and middle school, me and my friends, I remember, we would play with cameras and work on editing YouTube videos. Um, there were also a couple of video games that I would play online, and I remember there was one called Neopets, and it let you um, it let you customize your profile page using HTML and CSS, which are web design programming languages. So that's kind of how I got into programming um, through working with web design through that site. Would you say because you were spending so much time with computers, playing, having fun, that that really did lead you into uh, the type of work that you're doing between technology and art at CMU now? Um, I would say so. I yeah. think it definitely like exposed me to this realm of like technology. Like it made me think like why like this does what it does. Like who build all of these things? Mm -hmm. I think it got me curious. I think that's where it all started. Because you um, could have just chosen drama and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. combine the two. So it yeah, is an yeah, interesting yeah. Um, uh, diversion, if you will, away from mm -hmm. drama. Yeah. yeah, and it feels like, you know, sometimes it feel, still feels like, like drama, like theater, and like computer science are really, really separate mm -hmm. disciplines. But after, you know, these past two years of college, like, like taking classes and just meeting people and like reading a lot of things on the internet, I realized like, Nowadays, nothing is separate anymore. It's, it's not. All, yeah, Everything it's we do is it's, it's so connected to technology. Yeah. How does it inspire you if, if, if it does, and what are you hopeful for in the future with technology? Well, I just think it opens up a lot of um, possibilities for artists in particular. Um, and going off what Joyce was saying, I kind of felt the same way when I came into CMU. I knew that I love music and I love the more technical side of computer science, but I wasn't really sure how to combine those interests. But through CMU, I kind of realized that the fields, there actually are a lot of intersections. And just like um, with the advances in the field of computer science, just in the last couple years in artificial intelligence and machine learning, there's a lot that you can apply to music and music creation, um, ways to enhance performances and audience engagement. Do you feel like there are any boundaries? Seems like the, the sky is the limit here, but do you sense that there are some boundaries? At this point, I, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like every day I see something that just like broaden my, you know, view of what um, computer generated or computer aided art is. So I don't know, I would say no, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would say just on the technical side, um, still in computer science, we're limited by speed. So there are a lot of problems that we could solve easily if only we had enough time to compute them. So I think that's definitely a challenge in music because something I focus on is live performance art. Um, and when you have to be generating things on the computer in real time, that does kind of limit you on what kind of computations um, you can do. So I think that there is a technical limit, yeah. but I don't think any, everyone has really scraped the surface of the artistic limit of what technology can do. What would you say to parents whose children are interested in art, technology, music, the, the, obviously the, the areas that you study in? Younger kids, how would you encourage them to encourage their kids? Mm, follow the fun, I feel like. Just do what makes them feel like, you know, really happy. Because that's what I did and that's still what I'm doing now. And I feel like, I don't know, like technology is not just limit it to the screens now. There are so many like little startups or companies are making toys or phys like physical computing objects where kids can learn programming. And there are just so many really, really creative ways for like, um, you know, like elementary school kids to get interested in robotics. And it doesn't have to be, you know, just like what engineers do, like programming on a computer. There's just infinite ways to get involved, I think. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think definitely the internet is just such a great resource. I know when I was growing up, both of my parents were artists, so they didn't have any technical experience. So when I was learning how to edit videos or when I got into music and I was getting into creating my own music on the computer, I had a lot of help just from Googling tutorials and looking at YouTube videos to figure it out. And I think that was definitely a great resource. And it's something I still do. Like, if I want to learn a new skill, I just Google it. And there's so many resources out there. Well, that is definitely the case. It's it's the common thing to just Google it. And you'll yeah. find it on <laughs> yeah. Google or on YouTube. And yeah. I really appreciate that statement, follow the fun. Yeah. I'm going to remember that. Thank you so much, <laughs> ladies, for being yeah. here on the show. Artists have always evolved alongside the technology of their day. We hope our guests have inspired you to appreciate new media art. and maybe even motivated you to start creating it with your kids. Thanks for being here and join us again next time for more IQ Smart Parent. Want to learn more about IQ Smart Parent? Visit us online at iqsmartparent.org for more episodes and additional tools and resources. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest to share your thoughts on being a 21st century parent. IQ Smart Parent is made possible in part by the McCune Foundation and the Grable Foundation.